talk uh, by Paul Rosenberg. Um, I would uh, just a quick announcement uh, before the talk. Uh, after the talk, after the Q&A, if you stay here, you will be able to see a trailer of a, a very cool movie that uh, some people are moving and they will talk about it. So just don't leave after the talk if you want to see um, sneak peek. So our next speaker is Paul Rosenberg. Uh, he's a, a very dear guest of ours and uh, he's known as a writer of many books, as an engineer. Uh, he's also an author of Freeman's Perspective, which is a, a let's say, a newsletter, uh, a monthly newsletter. And uh, about two hours ago, I got uh, uh, an issue number 100. So congratulations for issue 100. I'm really happy to read it. It's actually my favorite thing to do every month. I, when I get this email, I read uh, the content, which is very interesting and unique. So uh, right now, Paul will talk about how we can uh, care for the old, sick and disabled, which is a common concern um, in the crypto economy and uh, in a uh, libertarian movement. So that's the complaint of many socialists. How are you going to care? So I'm looking forward to hear the answer. <laughs> so welcome, Paul. Thank you very much. The really, the genesis of this talk is from conversations here uh, over the years where people would say, gee, what if we win? Now, winning is really not the right word, but we'll use it for any, it's not really a battle, it's an evolution is what it really is. But let's just leave it that way. So what happens if we win? So the whole world goes decentralized, you know, bit by bit, however many years it takes, but the whole world goes decentralized. What about my grandma? What about the people who are disabled in some way, who are blind, or who are, as we used to say when I was a boy, not quite right in the head? Um, what, do we, what do we do with people who are damaged somehow? How are they going to be taken care of? And the first thing that hits people when this question comes, for me it was, and for I think most of us, is kind of this wave of fear, like, oh my God, no one's going to take care of them. That's going to be horrible. Old people will die. Uh, things are going to go really bad. So I'm kind of a natural radical. So if I felt this stuff, I imagine that pretty much everybody feels it to one level or another. So the first thing I wanted to do before we do this is to talk about fear. Fear is a real problem for humans in our time. It just is is. And we need to remember this. We focus on fear way too much. So let me, so this is your mind on fear. The, the lines on the right, if I say to you, A, B, or C, which one is the same length as the one on the left? Well, you're going to look at it and you're going to go, well, A, A is shorter, B is longer, and C is you know, just about the same. Well, when they did this, this is from an experiment run by a man named Solomon Ash many years ago. And they found out that when they asked people this question, and under neutral circumstances, 99 point some percent of it said, well, of course, it's C. C is the same length. You know, A is too short, and B is too long, and C is the same length. However, if they put them down in the midst of a room of other people, actors is what they were, but they didn't know, saying, Oh, A is longer. No question, A is longer. Or, you know, B is, you know, or A is the same, or B is the same. They could get 75% of the people to agree with them. Okay. This is what happens to our minds on fear. In this case, it was conformity fears. Everybody else is saying it's, it's, it's A. Yeah, well, okay, yeah, okay, it's, it's A. And 75% of people can say something really, really stupid under the influence of fear. This is what fear does to us. So when this subject comes up, and again, if for me, and if it was for me, I'm sure it's for pretty much everyone else, the first thing are all these fears, everything that could go wrong. I mean, if the state doesn't do this, who's going to do it? Something, people are going to die. Okay, so this is one of my little test cases. 
This is before there was any social safe safety net. This is my town. This is Chicago, where I grew up and where I live again now, in, yeah, I'm guessing 1910. Where are all the starving old people? There was no social safety net. This is reality now. You know, the, the fear is, is, you know, ephemeral. This is, this is reality. Where, where are all the starving old people? They're not there. I knew people who were alive and walked up and down these streets in 1910. If I had a good enough, you know, microscope and the, and the quality was good enough, I might even know somebody in that, in that photo. Um, there weren't streets full of starving old people. They were taken care of. They were taken care of differently than now, but they were taken care of. They didn't die. They weren't starving. Even if they were old, even if they were disabled, people took care of them. Humans do that when you let us alone and you let us do it. They did it. So there's the fear and here's the reality that you just, and I, blew, I enlarged this so I could really double check, and there are no starving old people in this photo. Um, now, th th this idea that if we don't, if the state doesn't do this, no one will. And what you're saying, without meaning to say it, is that these people aren't compassionate enough. They won't do it. These working guys over here, these, all these people hustling for a train, these children that are playing, when they grow up, they'll be no good too. None of these people are compassionate enough, care about us enough, will extend their hand to take care of us, but these guys will. <laughs> That's really what we're saying. You know, we don't mean it like that. Nobody really means it to, to, to say that, you know, uh, Joe Stalin is, is more compassionate than the guy down the street. But that's really, you know, these people, we, we say, no, no, we'll all, you know, grandma will die. She'll be eating cat food and she'll die. And, but, but these guys will take care of us. And I, I left this in there for editorial purposes. That's a World War I trench. And it, everyone should remember that forever. Um, but that's really what we're saying when we say only the state can do it. Because this is the reality of who these people are. Now, we also, what does the fear say? The fear says, oh, the system, it just is. It, 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 you can't, you know, don't question it. It's the way it is. This is a free hospital, a government hospital in the United States, uh, a VA hospital for whoever knows what that means, um, where this is just a lady. She just took out her cell phone and took a picture where they sent her husband to be treated. And this was a treatment room, an active treatment room in a government hospital in the U.S., so the system that we fear getting rid of, what is it? Is it really that? Or are we just kind of you know, playing a little game of idolatry of what, it, you know, what we think it ought to maybe should be and we imagine that it is when we're afraid? This one is, I don't even like looking at this very much. This is a website in the UK that keeps track of how many children die underneath the care of the state social safety net. And the page went on for a long, long, long way. And, you know, I don't, I don't even, you know, dying kids, that's too much for me. That's too heavy. I don't even like looking at that. Um, the whole model of these, the centralized model, you know, things only the government can do and things like that, it's, when you actually crunch the numbers, it's kind of sick. Here's, this is in the United States, which are easy numbers for me to get and work with. Um, it's not, it's different everywhere else, but not that different. This is in the U.S. All told, the social safety net in the U.S. is $2.5 trillion a year. Now, it's actually 2.7, my editor tells me. But let's go with 2.5, close enough. Um, that equals, this is what they spend every year that they take from people and print up bonds and all the things they do. That's 8.3 million new houses every year and to feed 126 million families every year and to provide health care for 231 million families every year. That's how much money that is. We don't have that many families in the United States. 
we have maybe 120 million families, households is the technical term. So all of this money that they're taking, it's way more than enough to take care of everybody. Not including what we already pay for ourselves to buy our own food and houses and medical care. What happens to this? This is what they're taking. This is what they're spending. How come everybody is not perfectly taken care of? Okay, because it's a horribly inefficient system. It survives mainly upon reputation. People believe that it's great. It's the only thing. It's, it's big. I mean, you know, it's big. Government's big. And big is, you know, better. It's stronger. It's, it does things. Big is good. Well, it, it's not really. Um, so it's horribly inefficient to do it in a centralized fashion. Now, this idea, are, are people compassionate enough? Um, again, I, I'm using U.S. figures. It may differ a little wherever you live. Um, but after, after half of their earnings were taken from them in taxes, which is any productive person in the United States, it you know, varies a little here and there, but it's in the range of half if you count up all the various takings of all different kinds. After half their money, half their earnings were taken away from them, Americans donated $298 billion to charity. So these people aren't compassionate enough? Really? Huh. That's interesting. And this is crucial, and we'll talk about this more in a bit. In a crypto economy, a real crypto, fully developed crypto economy, you don't lose half your money in taxes. You pay for what you want to pay for. You don't lose it. You don't have it taken forcibly and given to this gigantic bureaucratic system that, you know, it ends up is in, you know, heart-shaped pools in some bureaucrat's backyard and whatever else it ends up as, or war machines or whatever. Um, so the fear really doesn't survive when it faces reality. Now, here are these people here. They had no national income tax, no state income tax, no sales tax, no social security tax, uh, maybe a little property tax. These people kept what they earned, and they used it well. They took care of grandma and grandpa. They took care of each other. Now, did they do it perfectly? No. They're humans. They do stupid things sometimes. They made mistakes. They got drunk. They spent it on the horses. They, they did all kinds of stupid things just like humans have always done. Okay? Here's the thing. Individuals adapt their behavior. Enforced hierarchies do not. How many people in this room have done stupid things in their life at various times? Okay? How many are still doing them? Oh, come on. <laughs> we adapt our behavior. If we go out and do something really stupid and hurtful, we'd stop doing it. We don't do it again every year. If we blow all our money on a, at a racetrack, most of us will stop doing it the second or third time. Okay? Some small percentage won't, and God help you. Uh, <laughs> but... Hume, individuals adapt their behavior, enforced hierarchies don't. They can't change the rules or it destroys the stability of their system. I mean, how often does a giant enforced hierarchy really change things? Every 100 years, every 50 years, not very often. But individuals change their behavior every day. So we adapt, and in here, let's pick on this guy over here. He does something really stupid this year. He's probably not going to do it next year. He's almost certainly not going to do it three or four years down the road. Most humans behave pretty well most of the time. When you drive your car down the street, you're driving on a highway from one place to another. And there's how many drivers do you see who are basically okay? And how many do you see that are a total jerk? You can see maybe 900 and some that are basically okay and one or two who are to who's a total jerk. But you remember the one or two. You fixate on the one or two and you ignore the 998. Because that's a problem we have 
and we need to remember that. But this guy, you know, he's going to improve next year. And so is everybody else. Now, here's another important fact, is that mechanized relationships, with all of these enforced hierarchies, are essentially, I call them mechanized relationships. You will do this. You will get the order to do this, and you will do this, or else. It's a rather mechanical sort of arrangement. They create atomized individuals, and what I mean is, when you are in this position, let's say you're this guy here, you get a whole lot of your life is just, in, just directly between you and him. Your taxation, your pension, your, uh, in the United States, is Social Security, um, how you can register your car and your house and everything else, oops, is all between you and him. And you stand alone. And it creates, it, it creates a situation that tends to separate us from other people. We don't have sideways relationships. This is monopolizing. And we have our relationships with power, the law. The law says we must do this. Financial, it's all controlled through a center. They must say we must do this. Here are the rules. We must register. We must do this. We can put our money in this investment and not that one and so on. We all stand as individuals. Here's what atomization does, whether on purpose or by accident, and I think most of it is just by accident. But this, Carl Jung wrote this, and he was entirely correct. He said, in order to turn the individual into a function of the state that is a part of this hierarchy, this forced hierarchy, dependence on anything beside the state must be taken from him. And this happens all the time. I mean, Jung was ever so right. I don't think it even happens on purpose most of the time. I think the people in government are just there and they extend their own power and extend their own realm as far as they can. And this is what they see. This is what they look at. This is what, what appears to them and it's what they do. And it, it's really not a good human relationship uh, to be atomized in that way. Everybody standing alone. Um, Voluntary relationships create a rich cooperative society. This is decentralization. Everybody can communicate with everybody. Everyone has an equal standing to communicate with everyone else. We can all interact as we wish. So if I'm dealing with my friend who I know, I know what he likes, what he doesn't like. I know what he might think about this. I know what he might think about that. If he says, hey, let's meet for lunch, I know what kind of stuff he likes, where I can go, what we can do, what's closer to him. If he's having a good day, a bad day, his kid's sick, everything. I know all this, and I can bring all this stuff into our relationship, whereas in this situation, all of that is excluded. I'm dealing with him as a number, not as a full, complete human dealing human to human as humans. So this is a much richer type of relationship. And the more we're atomized, the more aspects of our life are just atomized, that we just, just us, the more we are robbed of this kind of relationship. And I don't mean that we should be less individual, or that we shouldn't have the courage to stand up when we're the only person. We need to do those things. But we, like to, we want to have rich relationships with each other. It's just more rewarding. It's just a better life. Okay, this is why decentralization is better. And what I'm going to be discussing as we go forward is not a social safety net, but many social safety nets. Decentralized, many social safety nets. Um, why is it better? We're no longer atomized. We understand each other better. We communicate better. And if somebody is having a problem, grandma isn't, doesn't have any money anymore, I understand grandma. I know what she would like. I know what she wouldn't like. And I can say, okay, let's put grandma together with this person, whoever it is, the niece, the nephew, a friend, whatever, whoever it is, and have some kind of relationship that'll work for grandma that she'll be happy with, that she's not just a number on a page getting a, a, uh, the, whatever the system gives her. 
some rules that were set 3,000 miles away by some politician. Something that matters to Graham. Um, nearly all decisions are made locally, which is to say the same thing. Um, our decisions involved conscious choice, not the edicts of a system. Very few of us are actually abusive. We're just not. Most people are pretty good most of the time. Yes, we have stupid days. Yes, we have stupid moments, but we don't keep repeating them because, for 50 years. We just, we, we don't. We just don't. Um, we are slowly getting better. Humanity is far less cruel than it was a couple thousand years ago. No question. People are far more creative and interested in being creative than they were even a few hundred years ago. We tend not to see these changes because we're in the middle of it. We want it to go fast, man. We want things to get better like, you know, next week. Why not now? And unfortunately, it takes time. But over a longer scale, humanity is getting better. Very, no question about it, very clearly getting better. Maybe not fast enough, but getting better. Um, we're already better than the rule makers. I mean, we just are. I mean, think about, you know, you can go, you can go to any bus stop in the, in the Western world, just about anywhere in the world, and make an offhand comment about politicians being liars and thieves, and pretty much everyone in the bus stop's going to go, yeah, that's not true. Um, we're, we're morally, we're better than the people who make the rules. We just are. You know, we have our bad days. We do our little stupidities, but we're not like that. We're better than them already. Um, what exactly will we do? We'll do the same things humans have always done. Always and forever. Except we'll do them a lot better. Because we can communicate now really, really well and really, really far and really, really fast. Um, money now with crypto can be transferred everywhere instantly with no bottlenecks. Nobody's telling you, you must do this, you can't do this, you can't send this, you can't do this. We can do what we want with our money now. So if there's a problem, we can take care of it, we can deal with it. And people who pay attention to what's important for the poor and disabled and so on, they know really well what works and what doesn't work. We've had a lot of experience, and there are people who have paid attention to this and kept track of what works and what doesn't work. And we have literature on it. We, we have people who know and who've written it down and have done the experiments and saw what worked. We know a hell of a lot now, more now than we did. And again, the information is really easy to transfer these days. So we can do a lot better. Now, if you want to talk about the social safety net, this is the big one. Right? This is not my family. I, couldn't, I didn't have time to get into the, you know, the box of my family photos. But it looked pretty much like this. This could have been my family. Um, but this is really where, well, I don't know, 90% of the real social safety net really in a natural condition comes from. Because these people know each other. They care about each other. You know, here's, here's little, little Annie, and, you know, her, her cousin knows her her whole life. Her uncle knows her her whole life. Her mom and dad would, would give anything for her. Grandma and grandpa love her and care for her. Who's going to take care of little Susie if something goes wrong? You bet these people know how. They know what she needs. They know her, and they care about her. Who better to take care of her than this group. No one. No one. And these people under a free economy, a real decentralized economy, their income just doubled this year. Boom. They've got lots of assets to do this. Fix up the attic. You know? Get a carpenter, come in, fix up the attic. We've got an extra room. Little Annie, come live with us. Or grand, let grandma come in. Let Graham, Graham will come live with us. Aunt Sadie is having trouble. Her husband died. We'll build, we got an extra, extra area in back there. We'll build a little addition. Aunt Sadie will come in. She'll babysit for us once in a while. We'll make a nice family of it, and everyone will be happy. This is what humans do, always. How many families there are? Um, there's a great line from a, uh, 
from a, a TV show, which is not very often I get great lines from TV shows. But one person's talking to the other and said, oh, my, my mother isn't, you know, is a widow now and isn't doing well. He says, what's wrong with you? He says, he says, do what we do. Put down some carpet in the garage and build up some walls and everyone's welcome. Come on, let's go. People do this and have historically done it. We only don't do it now because, well, because other people don't do it. Uh, it's not everyone's doing it. So we're afraid, again, the conformity experiment. We're afraid to do it because no one else is doing it. Okay? But I got to tell you, when you do take in people and, and do things like that, it makes it a really rich part of your life. It, it helps them and it helps you. It makes your life richer. Um, this is another social safety net. I wish I had a better picture. I, I did work for these people in like 1981, <laughs> 1982. And I had the thought in the back of my head at the time, gee, I should have a picture of this place, but you know, I didn't carry around a, an Instamatic camera with me in 1981. Um, but this was a Christian group. And, of course, the number two place of charity historically is churches and synagogues. I mean, they take care of people. Not perfectly, not everything, but so what? Nothing takes care of them perfectly. I mean, the system now, please. You know, people die. I mean, people literally die in this system. Um, so this was a Christian group back in 1909 before the aforesaid state tax, national tax, local tax, tax on your electric bill, tax on your car, you know, whatever. And they put out their money. I used to, I used to fix up their machines for them. They fed, they fed guys who were drunk all, every day, who were just, they used to call, we used to call them bums when I was a kid. It's probably considered very rude now. I don't use it anymore. Um, but they were guys who were drunks. But they said, you know what, these are human beings. And, you know, could be your uncle, man. You know, try, let's do something and help. And they would feed them. And they had, you know, the, the cases, the steam trays and the food every day. And I was the young guy who wired it all up and made it work. And they did this every day, all day for decades. They only finally went out of business in like 1990-ish when just the government just was taking over everything and they just rolled into a government organization and vanished. Um, this is another one that I saw all my life, self-reliance. They used to have uh, a big office uh, on one particular street they used to, I used to drive by. Uh, and they f were the Ukrainian group, and they t looked after their own guys. This is another way people do it. Uh, we're all from the same place. Let's help take care of each other. I used to know all the Bulgarians that, the, that there was one particular home where if, when the guys first came into town, they would go and stay with such and such family and they would take care of them and they were my friends. And lots of them came and, came and went and they had problems. Oh, so-and-so can help you. Or I need a job. Oh, that's right, you, are, uh, you can do this. You know, you should talk to so-and-so's brother. They can get you some, something. And this worked. I, for years I watched this work among the Bulgarians. And I drove by this place for years and years and years until finally they were essentially pushed out, not directly, but essentially pushed out by the state and became um, a credit union, a, a kind of a bank. This is a <laughs> little bit cleaner. Little bit was a little Korean, little skinny Korean lady with a name you couldn't pronounce it. And so everyone called her Little Bit. <laughs> and, uh, and she was my friend's wife, actually. And Little Bit was the Korean banker. 30 minutes in, okay. Little Bit was the Korean banker. And when uh, you know, a young Korean couple got married, they would come in and they'd see Little Bit, and they'd come in and every week and they'd hand her you know, a couple hundred bucks. And they would come in every week and hand her you know, a couple hundred bucks, and a Little Bit kept track of it. And she also knew the Korean guys who had money, and, she kept, and they would keep track. And they, she said, you know, Mr. Park is doing really well, and, and they're a nice family. I know their neighbors, and they're, they're, they live really, they live well. They're, you know, quiet, nice neighbors, and they need a house. Well, let's see what, have them go look for a house and see what they come up with. And they would put up the money and make sure the Park family got the house. 
and they didn't have to rely on crazy mortgage rates and everything coming and going. They took care of themselves for years and years. I knew Little Bit for a long time. She's passed away, unfortunately, now. Um, I don't know who the new Korean banker is, but it was Little Bit for a long time. Um, here are a couple stories I want to tell you. Um, crazy Joe, Crazy Mary, and Jewel. This is, this is really stories of my neighborhood. Um, usually you wouldn't call somebody crazy, it's a little, you know. But Crazy Joe called, called himself Crazy Joe. And Crazy Mary called herself Crazy Mary. I'll start with Jewel. Jewel is the local grocery chain. Jewel, for as long as I can remember, and it's a big chain, it's got to have hundreds of stores. For as long as I can remember, Jewel has hired disabled or partly disabled people to bag the groceries. In other words, you get your groceries in the United States, usually somebody puts them in a bag for you and loads it in your cart. They hired disabled people always. They still do. I went to a Jewel about a week ago, and they have disabled people bagging the groceries for you, always and forever. And this is one of the ways actual normal humans help each other. And Jewel's been doing it for 50 years at least. And I just go to any jewel you go to, there's a strong likelihood that there's some, you know, some person there who's mentally damaged a bit, but enough that they can bag groceries and have a normal life. They end up getting their own apartment. They end up living a mainly normal life. You don't get that in an institution. Now let me tell you about Crazy Joe. Crazy Joe was a guy from my neighborhood, a few years older than me, who just wasn't right in the head. I don't know what, you know, some I'm sure doctor diagnosed it at some point, but Joe couldn't do the things that the rest of us did. I mean, don't ask Joe to do a math problem. He can't do it. It's just not his fault. He just can't. But Joe was a nice guy. And the guys his age, again, a few years older than me, invited him to all their parties. And everybody took care of Joe. Everyone in the neighborhood took care of Joe. And I remember one time my buddy, my buddy and I, Murray and I, ran into him, and Joe was kind of looking around like this. Hey, Joe, how you doing, man? Oh, I'm okay, but, you know, I need to get to Jimmy's house. I got the address here. I don't know how to do it. No problem, Joe. Looked at it. Okay, here, you're going to stand right here. When the bus comes, it's the only bus that comes here, and it's going to come here, and you, you got 40 cents or whatever it was to, to pay the man. Yeah, yeah, I got it in my, in my pocket. Go in, put the 40 cents in the thing, and tell him you want to go here, and he'll tell you where to get off. Everybody took care of Crazy Joe. If anybody had hurt Crazy Joe, he would have had a lot of bitter enemies the next day. Everybody took care of Crazy Joe. Nowadays, Joe would be in an institution. But Joe had a regular life. He was one of the guys. He went to the parties. People took care of him. Hey, Joe, you know, whatever. And he, was, he actually had friends in a real life. And everybody understood that Joe, you know, don't ask Joe, you know, to, to figure something out for you because he just can't do it. But if you want to sit and, and hang out and, and, and talk and have fun, he was a nice guy. Um, Crazy Mary. Mary was a, a young girl, 25 or so, when I really used to see her along my way. And she, again, wasn't quite right at the head. And she wanted to, to live a normal life and didn't want to be institutionalized. She would stand in front of the grocery store and say, for 50 cents, I'll help you, I'll help you load all your, your groceries. And people would say, of course. And you come and help me load the groceries and load them. And eventually a family took her in. And I knew Mary, you know, and she said, I don't want to go to any of those places, which, you know, like the institutional things. And eventually a, a family, a mom and dad and a couple of kids took her in and made her part of the family. Mary had nobody. She was really, you know, a lost soul. She wasn't quite right in the head and had no, she was an orphan, no family. At least I think she was an orphan. Um, but these are type of things that I have seen in my life without looking for them. Um, this is uh, the charity of a friend of mine. Uh, he has a particular kind of currency business. Um, he and people in his same business have done well over the years, and they created their own charity. 
and they buy school supplies for kids who don't have them. Their parents are poor, their parents aren't there, their parents don't care. They put literally millions of notebooks and pencils and rulers and everything else to kids who wouldn't have them. Nobody asked them to do this. It's my buddy and his wife. A lot of other people now. Okay? They did it because they cared. A GoFundMe. I mean, there's some, you know, a lot of things that I've known that I've given money to GoFundMe. This is one particular one. I don't have time to tell you the story. Unfortunately, it's a good story. Um, this is a Mexican kermes where it's a, somebody gets sick. I was, one, I was at one this last summer where there's a, a lady, um, 30, 40-ish, uh, who has cancer. And the insurance wasn't going to cover it, at least, you know, cover major parts of it. So all of the people from their little town and from the surrounding towns who came to the United States, which is a lot of them, they said, you know, let's do a kermes. Okay. So I went, got a park, and people came, and one family made a whole bunch of tacos, the other family made a whole bunch of, uh, you know, whatever, all the various types of Mexican food, and you'd buy tickets for, you know, however many dollars for tickets, and then you'd go buy the food, and all of the money went to the sick fam to la the family of the sick lady. Happens all the time. Humans do this. We always have. Um, this is just for, you know, for fun. Um, nobody would really think of this right off, or very few people would. 69% of the firefighters, the firemen, what are I, I guess fire persons, whatever, mostly men, um, are volunteers in the United States. There are a lot of volunteer fire departments all over the United States. And if there's a fire, phone calls go out to him and him and him and him and him and him and, him and all the guys show up. And they go, you know, put out the fire. It's volunteers. It's people do this. Now, this is the one when you say, you know, okay, you got this and you got this and you got this and you got this. You got all these various social safety nets. But still there are cracks and things fall through the cracks. Well, yes. And they always will. There's always going to be exceptions to everything. Nothing we're going to do is going to be perfect. Nothing we have, if what we have now is a million miles from perfect. And if ever we reach perfection in this, it's going to be in so many thousand years, not next, not next year. But for the cracks, then you have things like we would consider traditional charity. I have been so, so happy with the crypto community in many ways for all the little things we're concerned about and we fight about and this or that or the other. and The people who made money in crypto have really done well with it. Crypto charities, and I know of cases where they're not a charity. It's just somebody said to someone else, you know what, I got all this crypto and I didn't really, you know, I mean, I wasn't planning on having it and I've got it and I've got more than I need. I want to give you, you know, so many bitcoins because you really need to be in the crypto space. You need to be involved full time. I'm giving you enough money so you can quit your job and do crypto full time because the crypto community needs you and I want you to do it. People do this. People have done this. And this person or group, I really don't know that much about them, 55 million because how many houses do you need? How many cars do you really need? Is it really about living well or is it really about impressing other people? Which, if it's the latter case, that's kind of stupid. Um, so the crypto people have done really well starting charities, giving money away, trying to find deserving recipients and giving them money. We're doing well. Now, we notice the problems. We notice the jerky driver and don't notice the 990 decent drivers. But we're doing really well. I'm really happy with the crypto community. So, in the end, oops, Martin Luther King was right. The hope of a, of a secure and livable world lies with disciplined nonconformists. And it's the way it is. It just is the way it is. Um, and that's what we have been doing. 
That's what we're going to be doing more of. And if we get the decentralized crypto world that we all want, things are going to be better. And they're going to be better for grandma. And they're going to be better for the guy who loses a leg or whatever it is. It's going to be different, sure. And if there are going to be moments when it changes from one to the other that are sloppy, well, yeah, there will. That's life. No one can promise perfection on this. I mean, if we do, we're, we're you know, rip-off artists. We can't provide protect perfection. No one can. But it's going to be better for everybody. By far. It's not even close. It's not even close. I mean, look at the, the, the money that I, that I was showing you in the U.S. They're paying double. Where is it, you know... That would, that's money that would be in our hands. Not to mention the half of our wages that are taken away. It's going to be much, much better. The, the hope of a secure and livable world lies with nonconformists. It does. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions, maybe more than a few. Uh, so if someone has a question. Uh, thank you so much for this very optimistic talk. Oh, thank you. Uh, it really gave me hope and uh, yeah, great uh, last quote. I also think that uh, um, disciplined nonconformist is really a, a great word. <laughs> Isn't it? We should yeah. all strive for that. But my question is, what if grandma's a jerk? <laughs> ah, no, this happens. This happens, and what usually happens is you put grandma in a room on the far end of the house. <laughs> and, you know, you, you're not going to throw grandma out and, you know, watch her, you know, wander down the streets looking in garbage cans. You're just, you're not going to do that. So you complain and you, you know, try to push grandma to the other end of the house and, you know, such is such are the, uh, the such is the sloppiness of human life sometimes. Right. Thank you very much for that talk. This is not a question. This is more maybe an addition. Um, uh, only two hours ago at the World Crypto Network uh, booth down there, we discussed a kind of very unusual shell money that sticks out of all the shell monies that civilizations all over the planet and time have used, and it sticks out because uh, that Micronesian civilization used a shell that was neither scars, nor did labor go into the shells, and the shells literally lying around on the beach, which every economist will tell you, this is crazy, this cannot function. The backstory behind this is that those shells once spent were not used as money to buy something else, but you would collect the shells that people pay, for, pay to you for you haven't done something for them, decorate their house with it, and increasing their social status in society by showing their potential of being able to do something for other people and showing that they have done something for other people, which is, I think, an incredibly nice uh, example that shows that it's literally culture um, it's nothing else. It's, it's, it's not uh, a law of nature or anything like that. It's our culture that we built, mm -hmm. um, where that society I just described is a society that decided your social status should be higher when you do more stuff for other people, whereas we have somehow created a society where your social status increases the more you take away from other people. So just wanted to add this to your beautiful talk, and um, thank you again. Oh, my pleasure. You know, it, it brings a, a really interesting point that there's this odd example, at least odd for most of us. I hadn't heard that one before. It's wonderful. Um, a lot of ways of distributing things to the poor, the sick, the whomever will surprise us once we get once we have the opportunity to do it. I think there's going to be new things that we haven't imagined yet. Because, again, when you have an open society, a, a decentralized society, adaptation can come from anywhere. 
Now, some of the adaptations won't be great, but some of them are going to be awesome and they're going to surprise us. Okay. Other questions? I have a question. Hit me. Uh, so, um, uh, there was a research by an economist that says that if you want to help someone in a poor country, it is much better do, to just give money around to random people than to, you know, bring in food and destroy local food producers and so on. And one of the centralized ways of doing that uh, is um, uh, that, uh, like a lot of progressivists and Democrats think it's a good idea, is universal basic income, which right. we can do also in crypto, crypto by printing money. I don't really believe in that, but what would be your response to this kind of solution? To a UBI, yeah, universal basic income. I think it's a very bad idea. Not for, not for the, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, not... You know, not for the money part of it. I'm giving people, you know, money is, okay, fine. Um, but it destroys all of the social connections, all of the personal value we gain from work. It's very good for us to be able, I used to do a electrical wiring projects. That was my job for a long time. Um, and I would find myself driving around town saying, See that building? I wired that building. I made that building work. See that building over there? I designed that. I did that. And it's good for us to, have, to see that we've been productive. We've changed the world. We've made things better. We need that. And we need the social interaction with, with fellow productive people and to learn how to work together in groups. Hey, Jim, grab that for me. Okay, let's go over here. Let's do that. Did you take care of the West Wing? No, I didn't. I had to do this. What about... And all these kind of interactions that we work as people and we're productive and we're creative and we're doing important things. Work is so much more than money. It really should never, it's, it's a relic of the industrial revolution that we think of work and money is together. Work is recreating the world according to our own will. We are remaking the world. I mean, this building, this was made by people. Somebody designed it. Somebody thought about it. Somebody did everything from making the bricks to transporting the bricks to deciding what's going to go over here. Somebody did this. This is human action. This is human will made real. And we need to do those things. And just to get money to sit home is, to, to put it in religious terms, it's a sin. It's a sin against the individual because they don't grow. They become less vital and in some ways less human. You've got to create. You've got to do things. You must exercise your will in the world for the good. Otherwise, what are you doing? What are you going to think when you're, when you're you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old? What did I do? I took a check. What the hell? Yeah. So it, it's, very, it's vitally important. The money I really don't care about. But destroying the dignity, destroying the productivity of work is a horrible, horrible crime against humanity. That was a very unique answer to this question and a very <laughs> beautiful one. So thank you. Does anyone have any more questions? Yes. Thank you, Paul. One more time. Um, I don't have a question, actually. I just want to share and... The stories that you told and the speech that you gave got inspired me so much and I'm, I'm not so, for a long time in the crypto community, uh, it's just a few months and I'm first time in this, con uh, is this, in this congress, but after your speech and after hearing other speeches and talking to people, I got such a huge inspiration that we are on the right track and that, that we are in an amazing era where we can change things, where we can contribute to a more liber liberate society. And I'm so happy to be at this time, at this place, and to, to talk to people and, and really to hear this story. So thank you very much. I thank all of you guys for, for kind of 
being he here and getting this information to the world and to the other countries. Thank you very much one more time. Thank you. Thank you all. So I think this is a beautiful way to end this Q&A. So thank you very much you. Uh, for your you. talk. Uh, please... Thank uh, you so Uh, please don't leave yet. So we have a special surprise for you, which you already know if you were here at the beginning. Uh, it's a trailer of a movie yeah, called, called Libertas, and the authors will tell you about it after you see the trailer. So please. Když jsme išli teraz na ulicu a náhodně se pýtali lidí, že čím jsou kryté tyto stvoje roky, většinou lidí by povedala zlato alebo niečím, že niečím to musí byť predsa kryté, že to nemôže vznikať len tak. Kryptoanarchisti veria, že kryptotechnológie dokážu ľuďom poskytnúť nový druh osobnej a ekonomickej slobody. Vidíme, čo sa deje momentálne v systéme, reštrikcie v obchodovaní, silné teda regulácie, kontroly pohybu ľudí a iné druhy sledovania. My sa teraz nebavíme o tom, že či budeme žiť vo svete, kde tieto technológie budú alebo nebudú. Technológie sú. Bitcoin je globálna, decentralizovaná účtovná kniha, do ktorej sa zapisujú všetky transakcie, ktoré sa v sieti bitcoinovej udejú. Nafúknutie tej ceny tam priťahlo obrovské množstvo kapitálu a ten kapitál sa tam dnes investuje do rozvoja tých technológií, rôznych použití, aplikácií. Myslím si, že bude existovať tzv. Uber na všetko. Your data is worth about 2,000 US dollars every year. So you could be making that money um, and that's what we're trying to do. Basically it is a P2P platform for short-term vacation rentals. Ten vývoj povedie k tomu, že, že tie štáty začnú byť o mnoho nepriateľské voči tejto inovácii. Vždy je ten rozpor medzi reguláciou a tými inováciami, ale niekde sa to samozrejme posunie. Ten štát spraví všetko preto, aby nevstal zdôrazný veľ a nevyhnutnosť sám seba. Možno bude trvať aj desiatky rokov, kedy ten štát si stále bude myslieť, že ešte plní nejakú úlohu, akurát ľudia ho budú stále menej a menej potrebovať a budú svoj život zabezpečovať nejakým iným spôsobom. Hi guys, so uh, what did you think? Was it okay? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Boris, this is, this is Slavo, and uh, what you just saw is just a small teaser for a project that we've been working on since last year. Uh, we decided to call it Libertas. And uh, it just started as a hobby project because uh, it's a kind of a cliche, but we got into the cryptocurrency just last year, so we're kind of a newbies in this space, but it captured us so much that uh, we decided to make a movie about it. <laughs> and um, uh, the goal of the film is to present to an average viewer the, uh, the way out of the system, basically. Because for me, when I got into the cryptocurrency, it was such a radical idea that I just had to tell somebody about it. And you know, we're not programmers, we're not scientists, uh, we're not hackers, but what we can do to spread the word is to make a movie about it. So, uh, <laughs> so basically, uh, we're, we'll, uh, we hopefully will try to release the movie next year, by this time. And, um, and the, the goal is to uh, uh, present the conflict between the old ways and the new and, uh, and offer, people to, uh, offer people some new way of thinking about their current problems because lots of people are bitching about uh, their problems on social, on social networks. You see negativity all around and there's quite a simple solution here, I think. So, uh, 
I hope with the help of uh, the people from Parallelpolis from Bratislava, uh, we will get this done and uh, we, uh, we will release it next year and uh, plan to run a few festivals, uh, air it in uh, uh, Slovak national television and Czech national television and then hopefully release it for free on the internet. So that's it, stay tuned, enjoy your congress and see you next year hopefully. <laughs> Thank you very much. We hope we will be able to screen the movie here at Hacker Congress next year. And uh, just uh, uh, a note, uh, many of you have seen the beautiful coins that uh, we have created and there's, a, there's an auction of a gold coin uh, that's also, that also contains uh, some crypto and it's uh, beautiful and it's happening uh, in... Uh, 10-ish minutes, 14 minutes in Slevarna. So if you would like to see the auction and have some kind of uh, fun uh, there, uh, we will